I'm so happy to be here with you today to honor your tremendous achievement. And I'll begin with Mary Oliver's poem, This Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thorough washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing today. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your wild and precious life? Mary Oliver. There's much that's wonderful about this simple poem, the way it captures a particular moment and so easily situates us in a place we can imagine, the way it asks questions that we might ask, the way it values curiosity, meaning, action, our lives, and importantly, how it ends. Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? This is really perfect for now, this moment in your lives at the end, which is really a beginning. <clears throat> now that you have made your way through intellectual traditions, through honors writing, perhaps through your praxis lab, your honors thesis, what do you make out of all of it? What will you do now with this exquisite and precious life? And I imagine each of us who have taught you, have, who have learned from you, would have different answers or suggestions. You must do this or that. And in Mary Oliver's words from another place in another poem called The Ponds, she says, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Still what I want in my life, she writes, is to be willing to be dazzled, to cast aside the weight of facts, and maybe even to float a little above this difficult world. I want to believe I am looking into the white fire of a great mystery. I want to believe that the imperfections are nothing, that the light is everything, that is more than the sum of each flawed blossom rising and fading, and I do. So listen what she's telling us to do, to be dazzled, to cast away the weight of facts and to float a little. My advice to you is simple and far less poetic, but I believe it deeply. And that is that you must explore the world and open your heart to all it will teach you. I've tried in my teaching to encourage my students to become explorers, to enter the world with their eyes wide open, to develop, as John Berger says, the sense of sight. Barry Lopez, in an essay called The Voice, describes an experience that perfectly captures what I would have you do. He says, once I was asked to be a seatmate on a trans-Pacific flight, the father asked me what instruction he would give his 15-year-old daughter who wanted to become a writer. And I said, tell your daughter three things. Tell her to read. Tell her to read whatever interests her and protect her if someone declares what she is reading to be trash. No one can fathom what happens between a human being and written language. She may be paying attention to things in her words beyond anyone else's comprehension things that feed her curiosity, her singular heart and mind. And second, I said, tell your daughter that she can learn a great deal about writing and reading by studying books about grammar and the organization of ideas, but that if she wishes to write well, she will have to become someone. She will have to discover her beliefs and then speak to us from within those beliefs. And if her prose doesn't come out of her beliefs, Whatever that proves to be, she will only be passing along information of which we are in no great need. So help her discover what she means. Finally, I said, tell your daughter to get out of town and help her do that. And I don't necessarily mean to travel to Kazakhstan or wherever, but to learn another language, to live with people other than her own, to separate herself from the familiar 
and then when she returns, she will be better able to understand why she lo loves the familiar and will give us a fresh sense of how fortunate we are to share these things. Read. Find out what you truly believe. Get away from the familiar. Every writer, I told him, will offer you thoughts about writing that are different, but these are the three I trust. Like many of you, I've always been a reader, and in fact, when anyone asks me if I have any hobbies or what do I like to do, I always say reading, and I mean it. Reading for me has always helped me imagine other worlds, other lives, and help me climb into the shoes of others and imagine the human condition from other points of view. And for me, this is the purpose of the kind of exploration or travel or deep experience of your home place or foreign place that I dare you to experience. Exploration will expand your vision and expand your understanding of the human condition. And again, from Barry Lopez, who says, the range of the human mind, the scale and depth of the metaphors the mind is capable of manufacturing as it grapples with the universe stand in stunning contrast to the belief that there is only one reality, which is man's, or worse, that only one culture among the many on earth possesses the truth. Lopez challenges us to be open to mystery, to things we don't yet understand or know. He says, there could be more, there could be things we don't understand. And that is not to damn knowledge. It is to take a wider view. It is to permit yourself an extraordinary freedom. Someone else does not have to be wrong in order for you to be right. So remember to live with your eyes and your heart wide open and take a wider view. I love T.S. Eliot's reflection in his poem, The Four uh, Quartets. He says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So become someone. Know what you stand for or who you are or who you want to be. And be a, an explorer of the world, as Lopez says, get, get out of town. John Berger, in his wonderful little book, The Sense of Sight, says, the way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe. We only see what we look at. To look is an act of choice. And what Berger calls the sense of sight is the willingness to be fully present, to be fully alive when you are in a new place, to always be looking for more, to sense more, engaging with your full senses, seeing, feeling, smelling, touching more always believing that everything is interesting, worth observing, and as I have said, worth learning from. As an explorer, alter your course often. Urban theorist Jane Jacobs says, the part of the richness of a deeply textured and interesting city are the many chances you have to turn corners or to walk down streets that are different for where you, from where you started. Sometimes that have different smells or shops or persons or opportunities. And when you're there, observe, collect, analyze, compare, notice patterns. Observe movement and rhythm and wake up all your senses because you will need them. And imagine where things begin and where they end. Notice who is there and what they are doing. Search for evidence of how people live and how they are living how they create play or fall in love and build friendships, how they make homes or do work, and imagine the infinite varieties of being a human being. Notice how places help us to understand this, to know this, and understand more. Be willing to venture into the unknown, to boldly be dazzled and astonished, and to write and tell and draw and photograph, or however you communicate what you have learned, do it. Be willing and open to be lost, and I mean this both figurative and literally. The closer man gets to the unknown, the more inventive he becomes, the quicker he adopts new ways. Buckminster Fuller, the architect who designed the geodesic dome, said this. Look Fuller up. He's known for his willingness to stretch the boundaries of the known, of tradition, of established systems of knowledge. He reminds us that to enter the unknown, you must be willing to step off a sort of diving board into a new space of possibilities. 
to understand things in this, what I would call the realm of possibilities, which is a sort of liminal space that opens you up to just about anything. So stepping into the unknown is not all that different from being lost. And if you think about it, there are numerous ways of getting lost. You might literally get lost. You leave your home or your hotel and you take a wrong turn and you end up in a place you didn't expect. And it might be a place that is gritty and raw instead of fussy and formal. And when that happens, it's quite wonderful. These places can be enormously insightful, telling us how real people inhabit a place rather than a polished, packaged view designed for tourist consumption. Getting lost is a sort of present, really, that expands dramatically what you will learn. And in the context of exploring, being lost is literally being in a state where you really don't know where you are, but that's totally okay. We use metaphors about being lost, lost in thought, losing one's sense of time or one's sense of self, all of which assume we prefer to be static, to be in place, to be safe. As humans, we seem to yearn for a sense of equilibrium after having explored the edges and pushed or expanded beyond the status quo. I can't even tell you how many times I've been lost and I've wandered into a cathedral or a church, like the Milan Cathedral, and literally caught my breath because of the strangeness of the dark spaces or smells within, or made adjustments to the brilliance of the sun reflecting off the stones of a piazza beyond, or turned a corner and caught my breath as seeing the most perfect stretch of street, most perfect ever stretch of buildings and colors and patterns and connections, of stories and lives I hadn't imagined, or saw a view line like that from the Tate Modern in London that stretches across the river to St. Paul's Cathedral and realizing hundreds of years ago, some architect designed that experience for me to have. And I know that there is a sort of spatial continuity between my own 18 year old self and my older self now where I feel absolute unadulterated joy in exploring a new place, discovering a new way of being, seeing a familiar emotion run across the face of someone so far from my own life. I remember those moments decades later with a heightened sensorial response. I can remember how I felt the first time I stood in the vast piazza of San Marco, how the air tasted like salt, how oblivious I was to the crowds, the stones of the ground, the conversations at cafes. And I promise you, if you are willing to explore, to open up, to sometimes be lost, you will become more. You will be dazzled by the brilliance of your experience. One final thought. It is really amazing to be here with all of you. You know, those of us who teach for honors and many of those who teach at the university more broadly, we throw our whole best selves into what we do with you in our classrooms, honestly. We search for perfect readings. We set up what we hope will be meaningful experiences. We design the perfect sequence of events or discussions because we love more than anything being next to you when you light up, when you get it, or when you make something grand and bigger out of what we threw into the room. We want to feel the light that you give off as you become your best, and we want to see all that you do. We want to feel proud of the people we have helped to expand, to shine so brightly that you will change the world with everything you do, with your brilliant, exquisite, precious wildlife. It is the greatest privilege, the most amazing honor to be with you in this adventure. Thank you.